Welcome to our next discipleship class. So today's class is obviously very important because it is foundational to our, not only our beliefs, but why we're Christians in the first place. Um, evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is really the foundational issue in Christianity. If there is no resurrection, uh, there is no Christianity. That's the bottom line for us. So <clears throat> I'd like to walk through some of these evidences so that we'll all be on the same page regarding um, how we can trust and believe in the actual resurrection of Christ from among the dead. Now, as we walk through this, I want you to understand that uh, evidence is something that um, you don't have to yourself be an eyewitness to to verify that something in fact happened. There's many things in history that we know happened um, because of other people that are eyewitnesses and the ancient world is really no different. So as we walk through this, um, let's understand that this is actual evidence. Um, it's not, um, it's really not hearsay speculation or myth or anything like that. Uh, and it is crucial to the foundation uh, of our faith as Christians. So why the resurrection? Really, that's the question. So uh, if there is no resurrection, well, uh, quite frankly, there's no Christianity. And Paul said, Paul the Apostle, he realized this when he said, if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is uh, futile. You are still in your sins. That's from 1 Corinthians 15. So if there's really no resurrection, uh, that means Christ didn't raise. And if he didn't raise, then uh, we are still trying to deal with our sins our own way. And there is no uh, faith in Christ that's going to change anything. It's a futile or an empty, um, really ineffective faith at best. And so God did not leave something so foundational to the existence of the truth based on faith without any evidence. God always supplies evidence because Christianity is an evidenced-based belief system. Um, it's an evidence-based faith. It's not blind. It's based in evidence. The Bible does not promote blind faith, but it teaches faith based on evidence. All preaching in Acts, as you go through the book of Acts, which is um, really, uh, other than the epistles and after the church began, is our New Testament history in the development of the church, but all preaching in the book of Acts and the motivation for Christian living in the epistles uh, in the New Testament is based on the resurrection of Jesus and our future inheritance as Christians. So we'll briefly look at three categories of evidence so that we can kind of summarize them into three. Now first there is evidence from history. We'll take a look historically at what that means. Secondly, we'll look at the evidence from Scripture. What does the Scripture say? Because we'll see from history that we can trust the Scriptures. And then lastly, uh, evidence from eyewitnesses because the eyewitness accounts um, based on historical analysis tells us that they are trustworthy. As a matter of fact, uh, though the whole Bible is not taken like that, even um, scholars that actually do not believe the Bible may be atheist or agnostic uh, will accept certain portions of Scripture as a historical document because it is historically verifiable. And then we'll go through a conclusion. So the evidence from history. We're going to look at uh, document transmission. In other words, how the New Testament documents themselves um, were basically communicated, uh, how they were passed on. Um, we'll look at the evidence in the early documents, uh, the fact that they are soon uh, after the events. Uh, 
we see the transmission evidenced in document quantity. In other words, there's a tremendous amount. There's actually more document evidence for the New Testament than any ancient historical um, writing uh, in the known world. I mean, nothing else comes close to it, uh, though that's not really communicated much um, in a lot of the secular schools and all that, and unfortunately sometimes even Christian schools of higher learning. Uh, the reality is, is that we do have more uh, and much more to draw on from the quantities of documents alone. Then we'll look at the reliability because certainly you can have good transmission. In other words, it can be accurately copied and transmitted, which is what that really amounts to. Uh, but maybe it's telling us a lie. We need to see if they're telling us the truth. So uh, it's evidenced in the historicity of the documents. In other words, we find out that the documents actually are telling us the truth. And some of that is the counterintuitive records. In other words, the records of things that really you would not put into a normal document uh, if you were trying to just create it uh, and not record actual history. When you record actual history, one of the things that uh, scholars look at is they try to decide, um, are there things written down that would really work against somebody believing the document because of the details that are placed in it? And the New Testament is filled with those, uh, especially in the Gospels. So uh, we'll take a look at some of these counterintuitive records uh, to see that uh, they do actually uh, give us an accurate historicity or a valid historicity and accurate reliability. And then we'll look at document corroboration. In other words, evidenced in extra-biblical writings and archaeology. Um, evidence outside the Bible um, that corroborates the Bible. Now, uh, some of this evidence obviously has come later in time, uh, but that's fine because no matter what gets discovered by the uh, spade of the archaeologists, as they unturn each uh, shovel full of dirt, they discover more and more that history only corroborates the Bible as opposed to uh, comes into conflict with it. So let's first of all look at uh, document transmission. And it's evidenced in early documents. So the New Testament manuscripts are within, and these are the copies, uh, they are written within 25 years of the originals. And the originals are very close to the actual events um, that are being written of. So this is unparalleled in the ancient world. Uh, Homer's writings are the next closest at about 500 years after the original. So um, there's really nothing to compare the New Testament with because it's so voluminous in, in, in what we have and then the closeness to the actual events of the recordings uh, removes any kind of um, distance where legend or anything else would get in between there. Uh, these were writings that were essentially written at the time of the eyewitnesses and the people involved, so they could have been immediately dismissed. Now, this is taken from uh, an older presentation by Dr. Norman Geisler, and I, I had updated it. Um, but some of the uh, quantities needed to be uh, updated, like if you can see on the right there next to New Testament, uh, to the far right, it says 5,800. There's actually over 5,800 um, New Testament um, manuscripts that are actually uh, in Greek. There's actually more than that that I believe are not um, actually uh, have been codified as yet, um, but they have been discovered. Now, the 25 means that the time gap in years from the original uh, the closest copy we have is probably within 25 years, like you can see. The next would be Homer, uh, and then it goes on down the list. I mean, we know quite a bit about Caesar, but, the you know, the first writings uh, of Caesar are a thousand years after his existence. And 
we only have about 10 copies of that. So um, <clears throat> Plato, the same, uh, Herodotus. So we have, um, we have an amazing difference uh, when we look at the comparison of ancient documentation when we get to uh, New Testament. Now, I'm going to put this chart up because I think that it's important to get a little bit of a perspective. Most of the New Testament uh, was actually written uh, within a short span. Okay, so uh, the cross we have put there somewhere between 30 and maybe 32, 33. Um, and then right after that, we have creeds that uh, started to be recorded. Um, uh, people were memorizing them because there were a lot of people that were illiterate. So the way that people could remember uh, some of the things about Jesus and the gospel. Uh, so they were put into creeds. And then the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And certainly, um, none, though it was anticipated in the gospels uh, during Jesus' life when he explained it. And then um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke recorded it recorded the prophecy of its destruction, um, all the Gospels write as though the temple is still in operation. And then we also see that in the book of Acts, where the, the apostles were, like in Acts chapter 3, they were going into the temple to pray, and then Peter and John ended up reaching out to the man that was begging for alms and then healed him. So we know that uh, even after the gospel periods, um, the temple was still standing until 70 AD. So the age of the eyewitnesses, John really probably uh, being the latest into the 90s, along with some of his writings, uh, really extends for the most part to the end of the first century, which would mean that after that, nothing was allowed in the New Testament anyways, because it was certainly not verified by a living eyewitness. Now, <clears throat> James was probably the first to be written, and they estimate somewhere between 45 and 49. Um, and Paul's first letter was probably in 49, which um, is really the book of Galatians. They know that 1 Corinthians was around 55, uh, 2 Corinthians about 56, Romans uh, between 55 and 60. And then Paul was killed in about 64, 65. So obviously, all of his epistles had to be written prior to that. So you're talking Paul's death. Um, realistically, uh, if he was saved somewhere between, uh, they believe, a year to two, possibly three after the cross, most likely within a year or so, uh, you're talking just over really 30 years Um when he was killed by Caesar Nero. At least that's what we get from church history. That's not in the Bible. But he was killed, and so all of his epistles were written prior to 65. Now, James was killed, we'll learn, and we'll see some of that archaeological evidence later on in the presentation, uh, in 62. And so when the book of Acts was written, that had to be written Earlier than that, Luke wrote it, right? So Luke obviously uh, gave no record of James or Paul being killed because the book of Acts ends with Paul in Rome. So uh, James is killed after that. Now, James, this is not um, James the Apostle. This is the half-brother of Jesus who wrote the letter or the epistle of James. And so before Luke wrote Acts, he wrote his gospel. And then before that, they know that Mark was written prior to Luke. So we have some, uh, some pretty early originals that are laid out here. So it's, it's pretty interesting. Uh, like I say, most of the New Testament was written, except for John's writings that uh, most likely were later, including the book of Revelation. And then the actual documents were early and within 25 to 40 years of the cross. So we're talking the actual originals were very, very early. You see, the majority of them were really within 40 years at the most and not even. Um, uh, we get other, like I say, other than John's writings, we, we get um, 
most of the New Testament in there. This obviously puts us within a time frame where legend and myth and all that cannot be developed because the eyewitnesses are still alive uh, of the actual events. I mean, you know, uh, 9-11 was 21 years ago. And if you were alive, you remember 9-11. I mean, that was a dramatic event for our country. Now, even though I wasn't alive, um, I know when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor uh, and we entered World War II uh, engaging with them, um, though I know it's reenacted in movies and all that, but you can read historical documents. You can go to Hawaii and, um, you know, you can see the boats still sitting there. Um, you know, at the dock, under the water. So you not only have, obviously, uh, evidence, but you have writings um, as to what had actually occurred and then the development of the war. But, uh, again, that was a drastic effect upon our country because we were attacked. And people that were alive certainly remember that, but people that were not alive but were so impacted by it, um, you know, they remember all these things, and certainly um, it would be impossible to just create an artificial scenario of what occurred because it was, there's too many people that have already established what happened in history. So we're, we're dealing with the same type of thing, even closer, though, when we deal with the cross and then the events right after that. And let's face it, somebody rising from the dead three days after they were killed— is a pretty dramatic event, especially where it put all the rest of the New Testament into motion. So then we see that these documents were transmitted and uh, they have a tremendous quantity to them, as I had mentioned. So there's uh, almost 5,800, or now probably a little more than 5,800, uh, Greek New Testament manuscripts, but they also occur in different languages. There's about 10,000 Latin uh, that begin really. Uh, the Latin Vulgate began around the third century, so uh, that's uh, very early. So while they were still making Greek copies of the New Testament, they started to translate them into other languages. And <clears throat> there's about another 9,300 Coptic, Syrian, Armenian, Nubian, and others. So we see that the New Testament was um, really uh, being massively copied and handed out. So it's not like later on. I, I mean, I've heard critics say, well, they went back and changed the documents. Well, that's absurd. Would they think they have a pencil and eraser? I mean, these are written on parchment or animal vellums or whatever. And so... Um, they were not going to go back and start restructuring thousands of documents to try to adjust them. They were written as they were written. They were preserved. And then uh, what we have today is really from the ancient world. And so in total, I think there's uh, about 25,000 New Testament manuscripts that are cataloged. Um, and those are uh, obviously, multiple languages, but they were all cataloged, many of them from around the same time in the ancient world. When you think about the comparison in terms of the number of copies we have for uh, the Gospels versus other ancient documents, uh, I can say in general that the copies we have of the Gospels are far, far more numerous than any other thing we have in the Greco-Roman world. Uh, including Homer, which comes in a, a distant second. Uh, and I'm splitting that between the Odyssey and the Iliad. Uh, we have, as I've mentioned, about 5,800 manuscripts in Greek of the New Testament. Uh, most of those are going to have Gospels or part of the Gospels in them. Uh, then we have other ancient translations of the New Testament, beginning with Latin in the second century. We have about 10,000 copies of Latin. Again, most of those are of the Gospels, and then they'll have other portions as well. We have Coptic, Syriac, uh, Georgian, Gothic, Old Church, Slavonic, Armenian, Arabic, Aramaic, uh, numerous languages, and those languages, not counting the Latin, come to at least 5,000, probably more than 10,000 copies. So when you gather all this material together, of, for the whole New Testament or portions of the New Testament, we've got uh, at least uh, 20,000 copies of the New Testament in, in some form uh, of these ancient languages. 
if you were to wipe all those out, and you had a magic wand, you could just destroy all of them in one fell swoop, we'd still be able to reproduce virtually the entire New Testament just from the writings of the church fathers alone, because they commented on the New Testament and they did not have the gift of brevity. And so these church fathers, we have over a million quotations of the church fathers uh, from the New Testament. Once again, the Gospels are the primary things that they quote from. Now, let's compare that to just the average classical author. Uh, the average classical Greek or Latin author has fewer than 20 copies of his writings still in existence. Far fewer, typically. Sometimes one or two. Sometimes we're, we have such massive gaps that somebody will mention, I've written these 35 books and we only have 18 of them, or only four of them left in existence. Uh, sometimes we're waiting a thousand years before we see our earliest copy. But let's say the average classical author has 20 copies, to be on the very generous side. You stack those up, they'll be about four feet high. Stack up the New Testament manuscripts in, in the various languages, not counting the patristic quotations, and the stack would be more than a mile high. So the, the, the comparison, it, 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 there is no comparison. It's just a massive uh, disparity. What you're dealing with with classical literature is a dearth of evidence. What you're dealing with with the New Testament is an embarrassment of riches. The question of whether we can be confident that we have uh, reconstructed documents extremely close to the originals that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John would have originally produced is another place where there's a lot of misinformation in society. Uh, textual critics of all or no theological perspectives agree that uh, with all the New Testament documents, and particularly with the Gospels, we can go back with uh, a high degree of uh, confidence to documents uh, as early as the second century, which may well have been copied directly from the manuscripts that were the first editions, if you like, of the four Gospels. Uh, and that as these texts emerge, we have larger and larger fragments preserved until as we move into the third century, we have nearly complete Gospels, and in the fourth and fifth centuries, nearly complete New Testaments. Uh, these represent uh, uh, amounts of evidence for which no other document or collection of documents anywhere in the ancient world enjoys. Uh, it's a, a luxury of evidence. And so while none of this proves that what the gospel writers were saying was necessarily all true, it certainly is more than adequate to show we know what their original claims were. So I think that, <clears throat> you know, the, both these scholars um, give a good and accurate representation of what we have as a text. I don't think there's really, uh, with what we know today, um, there's really no, uh, there's no way to legitimately criticize the accuracy of what we have in the New Testament. How about reliability? We look at the reliability. So we know they were transmitted, but were they telling the truth? They were transmitted accurately, accurately. Uh, but let's take a look at that. So evidenced in the historicity of the documents, we know that the reliability will be seen in their historicity. Um, how is that? Well, there's names, dates, and people current in the society um, that are mentioned by the New Testament authors. In other words, um, it eliminates the claim uh, that the New Testament is only legend. So while they were writing, while they were putting, in a sense, pen to paper, um, they were writing about people that actually existed at that time. And uh, even if uh, somebody may not have been in uh, a position, but had been in a position at the time of what they were writing about, you know, maybe uh, five or 10 years earlier, somebody was in a uh, political position. The point is, is that they're writing about a time when people were in positions uh, that could have immediately been discounted if any of it was inaccurate. So we see it's not a legend. And here is, here's an example from Luke chapter 3, the first couple of verses. Now in the 15th year 
of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturea and the region of Traconius, uh, Traconitis, and Licinius, tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Now, so we have people in the Bible here, but most of these are people that are outside of the Bible. In other words, they are not, in a sense, for the most part, Bible characters. I mean, they are. Uh, we know that Pontius Pilate was uh, involved, and uh, Herod, and certainly, um, you know, the Caesars uh, were behind the scenes. But, but the point is, is that these are people um, that are actually in actual political positions in Rome, in power, um, and, and even Annas and Caiaphas, um, you know, one was high priest, the other one used to be high priest, which was very unusual uh, at that time because you only have one high priest. So um, notice it says, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. Now, if that was inaccurate at all, saying that it was, there was two because uh, it was really, um, you know, the one was the high priest, the other uh, had been high priest and but was actually though he wasn't holding the position was really respected as the high priest uh, so it's really interesting that specific dynamic and um, the Jews that were reading this immediately would have said well that's not accurate uh, this is a bunch of um, inaccurate dribble so uh, obviously Luke was very very specific he's been analyzed by historians and uh, they have concluded that he is one of the most accurate historians that they have ever read in history. So moving on, we have uh, the fact that, you know, they had the New Testament has names, dates and people currently in the society. Right. The New Testament documents cite more than 30 people confirmed by secular sources or archaeology. In other words, the New Testament gives us a list of people that uh, are, in a sense, living at that time that are confirmed outside of the Bible. So uh, just to run through these real quick, we got Agrippa, Agrippa 1 and 2, uh, Annas, uh, Ananias, I'm sorry, Annas, and then uh, Aretas. So as we see here, we go on with Bernice, uh, Augustus, Caiaphas, uh, Claudius, Drusilla, um, the Egyptian, uh, who was a false prophet in Acts 21, uh, Aratus, Felix, uh, Gallio, Gamaliel. Uh, and again, I'm just going to kind of put these down here. You can see these are all people that are in the Bible, but they are actually people that have been corroborated uh, outside of the Bible by various writings. And uh, this is, we have 31 listed, so they're confirmed by secular sources or archaeology of actually existing during that time. There are unique labels given for current naming conventions that reveal eyewitness detail. Now, this is really interesting, though we're not going to go through them in detail because there's too many. In the book of Acts, the second half from Acts 13 to the end, um, there are 84 historically confirmed eyewitness details. Luke includes several others in his gospel. Now, um, this was; uh, these are all cataloged by uh, Colin Hemmer in his book, um, Acts in the Setting of uh, Hellenistic History. And this is referenced in I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist by... Uh, Frank Turek and Norman Geisler, uh, which I would highly recommend. They go through all the details of this in that book. I would really recommend that you get it. It is a great um, analysis and uh, piece of apologetic work to excuse me to demonstrate the accuracy um, of not only these pieces we're talking about, but so much more. Now, in the Gospel of John. He has 59 historically confirmed or historically probable eyewitness details. Again, you, you can read the details of it in that book. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, but um, they're taken from uh, 
the historical reliability of John's Gospel by Craig Bloomberg, one of the scholars that we just heard uh, in the previous video. So uh, these things, um, though, do not appear to be something that we would normally grasp if you just read the Bible like a novel. But um, these guys are pulling out detailed pieces of information. When you go back to the original languages and then the history, so the original language of the New Testament is in Greek, it's not English. And so when you go back and um, you understand historically what was happening at that time, you realize that these are eyewitness accounts. These are details that were put together by people that were actually there. Um, and it's quite fascinating as you walk through it. Now, we also see that the New Testament is evidenced in the counterintuitive records um, that are there. For example, there are negative and unflattering statements about Jesus and his followers. So let's look at some of these. He was considered out of his mind by his own family who came to seize him and take him home in Mark chapter 3. Um, he was deserted by many of his followers. Remember in John chapter 6, after he had fed the 5,000, you know, he started talking about, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, uh, you have no life in you. Um, obviously, he was not talking about cannibalism. They were struggling to understand what he was talking about because he was talking about their spiritual nourishment coming to him, believing in him, um, because they just wanted somebody that was going to give them bread. They wanted an economic solution so that they would always be fed. And he was trying to move them from that physical aspect over to the spiritual. Either way, um, he said things they couldn't handle. And it says many of them turned away except for the apostles. You know, he said to Peter, are you guys also going to leave? And he said, Lord, to where, where are we going to go? Who, who else has the words of eternal life? But you're talking about everybody that he just fed in the feeding of the 5,000, the ones that crossed over the Sea of Galilee to find him on the other side so that they could continue to get some benefits from him uh, and possibly make him king. Um, he challenged that, and then they ended up turning away uh, other than the apostles. So uh, he wasn't believed on by his own brothers, uh, his siblings, when he was um, getting ready to go up to the temple. They were giving him a hard time. That's in John 7. He was thought to be a, a deceiver uh, later on in John 7. Uh, he turned off Jewish believers to the point they wanted to stone him in John 8. He said, before Abraham was, I am, uh, taking on the I am name of uh, Jehovah back in uh, Exodus 3.14 with Moses at the burning bush. So uh, they obviously understood exactly what was going on. This happened a number of times in the Gospel of John, but this is one that we're pointing out to you. He was accused of being demon-possessed and mad in John chapter 10. Um, he was called a drunkard in Matthew 11. Uh, he was called demon-possessed um, in Mark 3, John 7. Also in Matthew 12, they said he was casting out uh, spirits by the power of Beelzebub, prince of demons. He had his feet wiped with the hair of a prostitute, which certainly could have been seen as a sexual advance by somebody that was not well respected in society. And he was crucified despite the fact that anyone who was hung on a tree is under God's curse. So he, he put himself in the position. Obviously, he was taking our sins. He was in our place. We were the ones that deserved to be on that cross. We were the ones that deserved to be under God's judgment. He took that for us, which is why he was in that position in the first place. And then the women are the heroes and the apostles are the cowards uh, in the New Testament story regarding the resurrection. Now, this is certainly self-explanatory. And in case you don't know, in the first century, uh, a woman's testimony did not equal that of a man. Even some, uh, in some uh, Muslim uh, nations today, uh, within Islam, it takes two uh, women to equal one man's testimony, sometimes more than two. Um, and during the first century, women were not considered as reliable. Their witness, because many of them were not as educated, but they were not considered as reliable. They would never be used if you were fabricating a story 
uh, they would never be used as a witness to promote something, especially if you were making it up. The last thing that you would do is use somebody that everybody would assume from the beginning would have less credibility to try to make your point. So how about document corroboration? We have um, document, the New Testament is corroborated by um, sources outside the New Testament or what we call outside or extra biblical outside the Bible writings and archaeology. So again, names and people current in society are mentioned by these extra biblical writers, which we'll see. Um, for example, Flavius Josephus, who was a first century Jew that recorded history for the Romans. Um, and I've highlighted in blue uh, the things that we want to emphasize here. So in his Antiquities of the Jews, he said, Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as receive the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ or the Messiah. Uh, and when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive and again the third day. And the divine prophets, uh, as the divine prophets had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him, and the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct at this day. So this was written afterwards. Uh, this was during the first century, but not uh, right at the time of the cross, but sometime afterwards. Again, Josephus says, Now some of the Jews thought that the destruction of Herod's army came from God, and that, uh, and that very justly, as a punishment of what he did against John, talking about John the Baptist, that was called the Baptist for Herod slew him, uh, who was a good man and command commanded the Jews to exercise virtue both as to righteousness towards one another and piety towards God, and so to come to baptism. In other words, he, John the baptizer. For that was the washing with water uh, would be acceptable to him if they made use of it, not in order to the putting away or the remission of some sins only, but for the purification of the body, supposing still that the soul was thoroughly purified beforehand by righteousness. So, again, um, Josephus corroborating what had occurred in the New Testament with John and his ministry. Later on, he says, Festus was now dead, and Albinus was but upon the road. Now, Festus was, we learn in the book of Acts, uh, which Luke wrote uh, right around uh, 6061 in that time frame. Um, he records Festus. Paul had to go before Festus in the later chapters. Now, uh, Festus had died, and Albinus was sent to take his position as presiding over Judea. So, uh, when he was gone, uh, this is what Josephus is referring to. It says, so, when he was put on the road, he assembled the Sanhedrin uh, of judges, um, talking about um, uh, the Sanhedrin getting together, and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ, whose name was James. So this is James, a half-brother, who was the pastor of the Church of Jerusalem. We read of him after James the Apostle is killed by Herod in chapter 12. James presides over the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. Uh, he says, uh, whose name was James, and some others, or some of his companions. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. Now, here's the explanation. This is what Josephus is talking about. Annas the high priest took advantage of the three-month gap between the death of Festus and the arrival of Albinus to Judea to take his place. The New Testament indicates that J James was the pastor of the church at Jerusalem, a difficult position to have if Jesus didn't exist. So, obviously, 
not only was uh, did Jesus exist, uh, but you, you can't be writing things about people uh, that are just simply fabrications. These are corroborating the New Testament. Uh, Tacitus, who was a Roman historian, in his annals wrote this. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, talking about Jesus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our proctorators, Pontius Pilate. I mean, I mean, he's got it listed out. In a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. Uh, how about Thallus? Um, again, uh, in, in talking about the eclipse of the sun during the crucifixion. Now, this is recorded by Julius Africanus, who wrote about 221. He said, on the whole on the whole world, there pressed a most fearful darkness, and the rocks were rent by an earthquake, and many places in Judea and other districts were thrown down. This darkness, Thallus, in the third book of his history, calls, as appears to me, without reason, an eclipse of the sun. So this is the reference to Luke 23, where it says, now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two. So um, Thallus wrote about this uh, in 52, um, not long obviously after it happened, probably, you know, t we're talking 20 years after it happened. And then Julius Africanus um, was referring to it in 221. Pliny the Younger was governor of Bithynia in Asia Minor, and he wrote this account around 112. So this is after, right after the first century. They, talking about the Christians, were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light, when they sang in alternate verses a hymn to Christ as to a God and bound themselves by a solemn oath, uh, not to any wicked deeds, but ever to commit uh, any fraud, theft, or adultery, never to falsify their word, nor deny a trust when they should be called upon to deliver it up, after which it was their custom to separate and then reassemble to partake of food um, uh, of an ordinary and innocent kind. So basically he's referring to their worship. The Babylonian Talmud, which is a Jewish writing, um, tells us on the eve of the Passover, Yeshu was hanged, talking about Christ. Forty days before the execution took place, a herald went forth and cried, he is going forth to be stoned because he has practiced sorcery and enticed Israel to apostasy. Now, this would obviously be um, the perspective of Jews that uh, rejected Christ. Anyone who can say anything in his favor, let him come forward and plead on his behalf. That's what was asked. But since nothing was brought forward in his favor, he was hanged on the eve of the Passover, again corroborating the New Testament story. Lucian, um, he mentions Jesus. He was a Greek writer and a, uh, uh, rhetorician. So he says, and this is a little bit afterwards, about 120 uh, to 180 or so, the Christians, you know, worship a man to this day, the distinguished personage who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. You see, these misguided creatures start with the general conviction that they are immortal for all time, which explains the contempt of death and voluntary self-devotion, which are so common among them. And then it was impressed on them by their original lawgiver that they are all brothers from the moment that they are converted. 
and deny the gods of Greece and worship the crucified sage, Tarmo Jesus, and live after his laws. All this they take quite on faith, which the result that they despise all worldly goods alike, regarding them merely as common property. Now, again, this is the perspective of a man that's not a Christian who's writing about the Christians, um, you know, as a historian for the Greeks. So we also have 10 ancient non-Christian sources that provide information that result in the same story, same storyline as we see the New Testament uh, provides us, right? So there are 10 ancient non-Christian sources, right, including those in blue with the selected quotes above that I'll show you. So uh, these are historians, Josephus, Tacitus, who we quoted, Suetonius, Thallus, which was quoted, and Phlegon. Uh, there were government officials, Pliny the Younger, he was quoted, uh, Emperor Trajan and the Emperor Hadrian. There were other sources, including the Jewish Talmud, which we quoted, and Lucian, the Greek writer. Compiling all their references together, everything that they had said, and we only picked a few, we get a story congruent with the New Testament. What does that mean? The basic New Testament storyline is confirmed by 10 non-Christian sources. In other words, here's the corroboration. The, this is what we get from them. Jesus lived during the time of Tiberius Caesar. He lived a virtuous life. He was a wonder worker. He had a brother named James. He was acclaimed to be the Messiah. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. An eclipse and earthquake occurred when he died. He was crucified on the eve of the Passover. His disciples believe he rose from the dead. His disciples were willing to die for their belief. Christianity spread rapidly as far as Rome. His disciples denied the Roman gods and worshipped Jesus as God. They actually denied all the different gods. This is what the New Testament says, really, without the New Testament. So these are corroborating extra-biblical writers confirming the same thing. There are archaeological findings that confirm New Testament people and their connection to New Testament events also. We have James, the son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. Now, uh, this is an ossuary from Jesus' brother, James, right? Um, and they've dated it between 20 B.C. and 70 A.D. So that would fall certainly within the time of uh, James' life here on earth, right? So uh, Josephus said James was ex executed in 62, like we said earlier. It was unusual to have the brother of a deceased listed in the inscription on one of these ossuaries. And there was a court case that verified the authenticity of the inscription in 2008. So they actually went to court to verify it uh, through ex experts in their testimony. Pontius Pilate, uh, the prefect of Judea, that was discovered uh, on the Pilate stone here. There was a picture of it. It was discovered in 1961, and it was dated between 26 and 37 A.D. So let's listen to Frank Turek and see what he has to tell us about it. He does a good job here. Another biblical character we know who existed via archaeology is Pontius Pilate. In 1961, in the coastal town of Caesarea in northern Israel, a stone was discovered which says Pontius Pilate, Prefect of Judea. We not only know he existed from this stone, but Josephus, the Jewish historian who lived from 37 AD to about 100 AD, mentions Pontius Pilate in his writings. He also mentions Jesus. He also mentions James and John the Baptist and some other characters in the Bible. We know these people actually existed from archaeology, some of them, and also from writers like Josephus. We also have the ossuary of Joseph Caiaphas, the high priest. Again, between 18 and 36 AD, this was discovered in 1990. So we're talking basically, you know, what, 31 years ago, um, which again is very unusual. And so we'll hear from Frank again on this since he does such a good job.
One of the most fascinating archaeological discoveries which authenticates a major character in the Bible is the Caiaphas ossuary. This was discovered in 1990 in Jerusalem. What's an ossuary? It's a limestone box that the Jews used from about 20 BC to 70 AD. What would happen if somebody important died? They would inter the body about a year later. They would take the bones out of the grave and put them in this ossuary, this limestone box, and reinter the remains. Well, in 1990, they discovered this very ornate ossuary that on the side of it identified the remains as the remains of Caiaphas. Who is Caiaphas? He was the high priest that sentenced Jesus to die. When Jesus said, I am the Messiah, and you will see the Son of Man coming with great power on the clouds, Caiaphas tore his robe and said, blasphemy, this man must die. The man that sentenced Jesus to die, we not only know he existed, we have his bones. When they discovered this ossuary, they discovered the bones of a 60-year-old man and his family. There's only one Caiaphas known from history, and that's the Caiaphas of the New Testament who sentenced Jesus to die. We not only know he existed, we have his burial box. Again, I would certainly recommend, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, uh, picking up that book. They do a great job in that. So, we also have the Pool of Bethesda um, that was excavated, uh, and they found the five porches or colonnades located a short distance from the Sheep Gate, just as it's described in John chapter 5. Uh, this is the uh, remains uh, that was found in 1968 of a crucifixion victim uh, from the first century, uh, it isn't Jesus. Uh, it's just somebody that, um, you know, was unearthed. And it's the discovery, again, that just demonstrates how they uh, crucified, how they used to uh, actually do that and evidence of that work. So <clears throat> before we actually jump into the evidence from Scripture, um, it, you know, it's it's climbing close to an hour we're obviously going to have to get into a part two on this, but I think that we have um, we have really come to a place where we realize that uh, we're going down the path of actual evidence. It's not it's not just mythical things that uh, we're trying to present here. This is actual historical evidence um, verified by good, solid, historically verifiable documentation. In other words, the New Testament and also the corroboration outside of it. So um, we'll pick up on uh, how we have evidence from Scripture. We still have two more points from Scripture and then finally uh, eyewitness testimony. But we'll pick up on that next week um, and uh, we'll enter into a part two. So until then, may God richly bless you as you continue to study his word.